Of course, I'm only going through this story because things went wrong. And things did start to go wrong about 2007. And one of the really important things to remember, and again, as I go through in the next few weeks, we'll go into this in more detail, but mortgage-backed securities, which were very profitable for as long as they worked, the demand for those increased. That demand, in, that demand in, basically increased the demand on banks to sell more mortgages. So essentially it meant that banks were under pressure while, while mortgage-backed securities are very profitable, banks were under pressure to issue more mortgages, to gener generate more mortgage-backed securities. Um, so you, the pressure wasn't because banks really wanted to be terribly kind to people and give more people mortgages. The pressure was coming from this, the financial products, the derivative, the mortgage-backed security. And they, to increase the volume of those meant the volume of mortgages had to be increased as well. So that's why that more, there was a pressure to increase the number of mortgages. Now the pressure to increase the number of mortgages basically meant that a sequence happened. Uh, prime mortgages, which for example, as I keep saying, you know, people like me who are a lecturer in university, um, we, would be, we would be given prime mortgages because the lending institution would work out quite quickly that the chance of us defaulting in the mortgage are not very high and so on and so forth. But uh, you know, uh, as the pressure for issuing more mortgages increased, um, you're going to hit the problem that you almost all the people you offer a prime mortgage to already had one and they didn't want any more. So to increase the number of mortgages that you're issuing, you had to give them to people whose income was, let's say, more suspect or had a problem. So, for example, that's that rather offhand example I gave at the beginning that, you know, that's the building society, the bank would give me a mortgage because I'm a boring university lecturer with a relatively stable income and a stable employment and so on. But on the, on the other hand, if I was a musician, even if I earned a lot of money this year, the institution would think, well, you know, we can't, the risk, we, we don't know anybody's your income in 10 years time. I mean, you know, it might have gone down to practically zero. So you may not be able to afford repayments. So issuing a mortgage or something like that would be very risky. Now, what happened in this in the 1990s and the beginning of this of this century is that um, subprime mortgages were offered to people with bad credit rating, I suppose, or people who didn't seem to be or uh, have stable incomes that would last for 20, 30 years, the, the length of the mortgage. And the reason, the reason this, was, this happened was because house prices were increasing. The, the importance of increasing house prices is that, that if, I don't know, let's say, the house I bought in 1990 was, well, was £100,000 by 205 or something, it was worth, I don't know, three hundred thousand pounds. So even if if I I borrowed sort of ninety thousand pounds in, sorry, one thousand and ninety, I think, did I one nine nine? No, I think I said two thousand and ninety. I do apologise. One nine nine zero to buy this thing, and um, I defaulted. In in two thousand and five, uh, the lending institution wouldn't be terribly concerned because they could take my property and sell it. They'd recover their loan, their 90,000 of whatever was left, which are, given that time scale would be most of the 90,000, um, they would, and I would get the residue, whatever. So, so you know, the, the, the bank would have been fairly happy with this. Now, the problem was, if house prices started falling, that wasn't going to hold. If the house I, I bought for an, in 1990, 100,000 was now only worth 60,000 in 2005. Um, well, the bank was not going to get their 90,000 back. By the way, I mean, this actually did happen. Um, the house I'm sitting in at the moment, which I bought about six years ago or something, 2014, sold. Um, <clears throat> it sold, it sold um, 
in about 2004, I think, for a quarter of a million pounds. And I mean, I have to tell you, I paid considerably less than that when I bought it. And so the value of this, the house that I that, that I purchased, had fallen very, very rapidly over between 2004 and when I bought it in 2014. And so house prices did fall. That had a knock-on effect on the the mortgage-backed securities. So this is what went wrong. House prices did not continue to rise. And the belief in constant house prices, you know, rising house prices, is an example of an economic bubble. Again, I think in the week 11, I, I go into more detail about economic bubbles, how they arise and how they develop and eventually burst. Um, you know, economic bubbles are essentially irrational beliefs that something that has been happening will continue to happen, even though if one, one took a step back and took a broader view of history, well, everybody would realise that this is extremely unlikely to happen. For example, I mean, if you looked at the, the silly money video in, in the workbook, um, one of the things they talk about there is that, that one of the things they know in the city that house prices will never go on rising forever, except this one, this time they did, and that you know that that notion, the tacking on this time they did is an example of an economic bubble, that you know mortgage-backed securities were good investment, they were secure as long as house prices kept going up. If house prices started to fall, the edifice was going to come apart rather quickly. Now the, I mean, this is a difficult thing to explain, and um, I'm not so sure I'd be able to do very well. But <clears throat> the financial system developed multiple mortgage-backed securities for mortgages. So let's say we start off with a thousand mortgages; they're bundled into a, a mortgage-backed security. Um, that is, that mortgage-backed security is in set bundled with a hundred other mortgage-backed securities which become new mortgage-backed securities. And it goes around this circle a number of times. Now, perhaps the good analogy here is the one that Peter Kay, again, in one of the videos that are on the, on the workbook page, um, where he talks about um, in insurance and reinsurance in, in terms of a rather big insurance claim that happened when the, the Piper Alpha North Sea oil rig went on fire. Um, that, that rig was... Just, I mean, the very simple story would be something like that rig was insured at Lloyd's of London for an enormous amount of money. Um, the the first firm, so to speak, the first member of Lloyd's that that insured that 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 from then uh, reinsured the parts of their of 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 their insurance with other other members of, of Lloyd's and so on. And that reinsurance, reinsurance kept happening. And so that when the thing actually went on fire and the disaster happened to the Piper Ralph in the 1970s, the member of Lloyd's were, were surprised to discover that they'd effectively insured this part of this thing multiple times. Um, that led to the names, which are the backers of the, the members of Lloyd's insurance insurance organisation having to pay enormous sums which had a consequence of some landed f gentry in, in, in the UK um, when effectively went bankrupt. But this is what we have here. The, the it coming back to the mortgage backed securities, the the bundling and rebundling, essentially what what happens after a time is that the underlying assets the underlying mortgages that are linked to these mortgage-backed securities become unidentifiable. Now, as long as everything is working right, nobody cares about this. You know, fine. Um, there's this there's, there's new mortgage-backed security, let's buy it because we know we can make money from it. However, if something went wrong with the underlying assets, things, things turn sour fairly quickly. And that's what's happened in, 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 in the financial markets. Worldwide, this, this, this happened. Because mortgage-backed securities were going to be 
valuable as long as house prices kept rising. If if mortgages defaults on mortgages increased, and the the banks, the institutions who lent the mortgages could not recover the money from the mortgages. That meant that the the assets, the derivatives based on these things, the mortgage backed securities were first of all were lose value. Secondly, it became very difficult to identify which mortgage backed security was losing its value. And essentially what happened in in the, this this sequence is that the the investing institutions came to view very quickly, they came to view that all mortgage backed securities were, were toxic. They couldn't identify the underlying assets. They knew that the, some of the underlying assets, at very least, um, were now worth a lot less than they thought they were. So the risk of holding the mortgage-backed security increased very rapidly. And that essentially, somewhere between the end of 2007 and a few months into 2008, caused the, the global financial system to essentially freeze up. And we have this sequence here that, you know, the money markets, they were dependent on mortgage-backed securities. Again, as, as I mentioned before, in the next, I think, uh, perhaps the third, the third lecture, I explain to great, in more detail why it was that mortgage, mortgages were the things that were used to back these securities. Um, but the fact that there was increased demand for MBSs, the mortgage-backed securities, meant there was increased mortgage lending. That quite quickly lent to some prime mortgages being lent. Now that worked okay as long as house prices kept increasing. But if house prices fell, the, the whole edifice comes falling down really quickly. And the reason that house prices started falling had to do with the subprime mortgages. Um, a lot of mortgages, I mean, Innovative mortgages, I suppose, as I would have been described, were, were developed which, in which the repayments for the first few years were very low. Sometimes they were even negative, which is not very often, but they sometimes were negative. Um, and then, after perhaps two to three years, the repayments increased very rapidly. <coughs> Sorry, I'm going to need some, something to drink here. The, the, the payments increased very rapidly. It was that increase in payments, particularly on subprime mortgages, that caused many people, who, <clears throat> in, particularly in the, the southern United States, where this problem, I suppose, started, the, um, to default on their mortgages. That, in turn, because the default was quite large, um, that caused house prices to fall. It had negative effects all through the economy, um, you know, People couldn't pay their mortgages, house prices fell, there was a drop of unemployment and so on, and there was this domino effect. And so in 2008, <clears throat> the global economy was in serious trouble of completely collapsing. Um, in all countries, almost, in, in 2008, I mean, there, there is exceptions, but in most countries in 2008, um, it, what was happily described as economic growth came to, crashing halt and most economies entered a period of recession. 